Odds ratios are everywhere. They are sometimes so important that they are in headlines, in newspapers and Facebook posts. Today we're going to talk about interpreting the odds ratios as they might appear in an actual medical journal. So typically, you might see a sentence that says the odds ratios, and then it will say parenthesis, 95% confidence intervals are presented in table three. So table three, and I just made up three, it could be table two, it probably wouldn't be table one. Um, table three could look something like this, and feel free to pause the video and copy it down. We have a risk factor, and, and these are completely hypothetical, so this isn't a real study, but these are the way odds ratios could look in a real study. So we have these hypothetical risk factors like vitamin D supplementation, vitamin C supplementation, vaping, and exercise. And then I gave you two different odds ratios. Now I want you to notice that one of the odds ratios is less than one, and the other odds ratio is greater than one. Now, of course, we're gonna go somewhere with this. I, I did this on purpose. And here we have some 95% confidence intervals. And we're going to see if we can learn how to interpret these. And it's actually a really simple idea, but it requires you to sort of know a little bit what you're doing. So the very first thing we should probably look for is to see if we can state the research question as a very simple question. Pause the video if you, and try to do this. Welcome back. So the research question is simple. Is there an association? And it's very important to use the word association because odds ratios come from case control studies which can't test for causation, only association. So is there an association between the exposure variable or risk factor, I'll just write, I'll just write the exposure variable and disease. So that is the research question and questions should end with question marks. Now the next thing you should ask yourself is what would be the null hypothesis and what would be the alternative hypothesis? Pause the video and see if you can do this. Welcome back. So the null hypothesis is that the true odds ratio is equal to one, the number one, unity, against the alternative hypothesis that the true odds ratio is not equal to one. Now, I, I phrase this very carefully. We can, we can talk a little bit more about this in detail. But if you're simply testing for an association, not in a specific direction, this is the hypotheses that correspond to this research question as written. Okay, now, the next question you might have is, well, where did I get the number one from? Why is this a one? Why is this not a zero? Why is this not a 536.23? Why a one? Well, to answer that question, we have to go back to the definition of what the odds ratio actually is. And the odds ratio is a ratio of two terms. Now, even if I didn't say what these two terms were, the very fact that it's a ratio probably should give you a little hint here that if the numerator is equal to the denominator, denominator not equal to zero, of course, um, then this ratio should be equal to one. But let's put it anyway. So the, this is the odds. So 
So in a case control study, which is where we're going to use the odds ratio, this is the odds of randomly selecting a study subject who was exposed, given that he or she was a case, divided by the odds of randomly selecting a study subject who was exposed, given that he or she was a control. So if there's no differ differential level of exposure, cases versus control, and these are exactly equal, then under the null hypothesis, you know, if the numerator and the denominator are both the same, then this odds ratio would be equal to one. And that's what would happen if there was no link between exposure and case control status. So with this in mind, it should be kind of clear that this one is the, is the magic number here, and that under the null hypothesis, the odds ratio is hypothesized to be one. So one is a very, very important number. So let's go through this really, really carefully and see if, if you can figure out whether there is a statistically significant association. And if we do identify a statistically significant association, the important thing is to then ask yourself another question. Is there significant protection or is there significant risk? So let's look at this really carefully. Now, I would advise you to pause this video here and see if you can interpret these confidence intervals. And then, you know, I'm gonna do it now. Welcome back. Okay, so here we have an odds ratio observed to be 0.71. Now I want you to notice that this odds ratio is less than one. So that suggests the idea that vitamin D could be protective against getting this disease, but we need to see whether this is statistically significant, right? Less than one would be protective, greater than one would be a risk factor. So here, what we do is we look at both bounds of this 95% confidence interval. We look at the lower bound, 0.68, and we look at the upper bound, 0.84. And I want you to notice something. Both of these bounds are less than one. So even accounting for chance, both of these bounds are less than one. So this is a statistically significant association. And it is a protective association because both of these bounds are less than one. So we call this, we could call this significant, I'm just going to write sig for significant, significant protection. I'll just write prot for protection. Or this is a, a statistically significant protective vari factor or variable. So, you know, you guys who's who have followed my videos probably know that I love vitamin D and I'm a huge proponent of vitamin D and I think responsible sunlight exposure where you don't burn, you know, and go a little short of that too is probably healthy, but I'm not a physician. I'm a statistician, not a physician. So here, vitamin D looks in this hypothetical data that I just made up, looks like it's, it's significantly protective because the point estimate is less than one, and both bounds of the confidence interval are less than one. So this is significant protection. Let's look at vitamin C by contrast. I purposely wrote this to have the same exact odds ratio point estimate because I didn't want you to think that this is what's driving the statistical significance, though this is what's driving the idea that there's there's possible protection here. So I'm going to write pos for possible. Possible protection. Because the point estimate is less than one, but you're going to be disappointed when you look at the bounds of the confidence interval because 
see the lower bound, 0.42, you might get excited about it and say, ooh, vitamin D seems like, I'm sorry, vitamin C. Vitamin C seems like it's protective. Look, this bound of the confidence interval is less than one. Ooh, oh, but this bound uh, is greater <laughs> than one. This would suggest vitamin C is protective, the lower bound. But the upper bound would suggest that vitamin C is actually a risk factor. Well, confidence interval, make up your mind. Well, this is the whole point, that the variability is so large in this point estimate that this is not a statistically significant effect. So I would interpret this as possible protection, but not significant. So I'm going to write this down, but not significant. And when I say significant, I mean statistically significant at the 5% significance level, um, because that's what we use in our culture. So this bound, again, possible protection. Oh, you could get excited. This bound, possible risk. They don't agree. <laughs> Too much variability. All right. Let's look at vaping. Of course, I made this up. I'm not a huge proponent of vaping. I, I wonder about this, but you know, I've never studied it myself. I just made this up. So let's say the odds ratio for vaping was observed to be 1.21, 21% increased risk. <laughs> All right, so the lower bound of this confidence interval which is really the best case scenario for vaping, still has this above one. So even accounting for chance, there's still 7% increased risk. This is above one. So, and the upper bound, you know, is 56% increased risk. I mean, so both of these bounds agree. They're both above one, which says significant risk. So anybody looking at this confidence interval would probably, if this is true, you know, I just made this data up, you know, um, would think that vaping is probably a significant risk factor. Let's look at exercise. Now, I made this up. Now, I purposely gave exercise the same point estimate of 1.21, but you'll notice here the lower bound is less than one. And you might say, oh, yeah, oh, exercise. Yeah, yeah, let's exercise because the lower bound is less than one. This could be protective. Oh, I'm excited. But, oh, no, look at the upper bound. The upper bound has a 69% increased risk <laughs> for getting the disease. Well, for differential exposure, not really getting the disease. Right? So here the bounds don't agree. This bound looks like exercise is protective, the lower bound. This bound looks like exercise has 69% more exposure in cases relative to controls, <laughs> right? Assu you know, taking into, you know, chance. This is the actual point estimate, though. Really, what we observed was 21% more exposure to exercise in cases relative to controls, on the odd scale, though. So if we look at this over here, this is a non-significant effect. So you could say, yeah, there might be some possible protection. Right? I'm sorry, possible risk, sorry. There might be some possible risk, but it's not significant. So here you basically, now it is possible to see an odds ratio that's 1.00. I've seen it before when the sample sizes are extremely small in let's say a certain subgroup that they might not have 
really planned for, but it happens that in a certain subgroup that's important, you might get so few study subjects that you could, in theory, see something like this. You might actually see this. Now notice, of course, you know, I put the point zero zero in. This shows that these things are rounded off. You know, this is, you know, this is just data. You could see that. Um, and you'll typically see this when the sample size is really low in a certain subgroup. You'll see this. Um, of course, you know, you take one look at this, you know nothing's going on here. There's, you know, no significant association from the data. But even looking at this, you might have a little column for N somewhere to see how many subjects were used. Well, it would be in the cases and the controls, really. Um, <laughs> but just looking at this, you could almost be correct in guessing that chances are when you see this, you're in a subgroup that has a very few number of cases and a very few number of controls. And this is really the best you can do, but this, when you see something like that, um, the better inference to take would be, you probably don't have enough data to make any inference at all. But some people would say, oh, well, nothing's going on here. You know, a confidence interval of exactly 1.00. When you see this, take this with a grain of salt and always look back to see, you know, how much data, you know, how many cases you actually had, how many controls you actually had with this particular risk factor and subgroup you were looking at, probably very, very small number of subjects. And so be a little careful of this, this situation. Don't jump to the no association conclusion. Better jump to the how many people were actually studied conclusion. Probably more helpful. So let me summarize this idea for you guys. Um, here we have point estimates that are less than one. So you're thinking protection, but you have to look at the confidence intervals to see if the protection is statistically significant. Both bounds are lower than one, significant protection. One bound is lower than one, one bound is upper than one, possible protection, but it's not statistically significant. Here we have an odds ratio estimate that's greater than one. So you're thinking risk. Here both bounds are greater than one, so this is statistically significant risk. But here you have a bound less than one and you have a bound greater than one. They don't agree. So the point estimate suggests possible risk, but there's too much variability in this to really conclude any kind of statistical significance. So if you've enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel so I can be encouraged to make more videos like this. And if you didn't like this video and you think there's something I could do better, shoot me a comment and maybe I can improve my delivery. Thank you.